Well, welcome. I am so glad you are joining us today. Today, I want to get right into the Word of God. We are continuing throughout the Gospel of Mark, a series we're calling simply the Gospel. And I want to pick it up in Mark chapter 6, verse 6. It says this, when Jesus, then Jesus went from village to village, teaching the people, and he called his 12 disciples together and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for the journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave the town. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their faith. So the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. You see, there is this misconception that these followers of Jesus, his disciples, were basically a bunch of guys that just quit their day job and they just sat at the feet of Jesus, just waiting for him to teach them. They just sat around in togas and uh, they just kind of snacked on whatever the snacks were of the day and they just waited for Jesus to speak. But that's not the case. We see here that Jesus sends them out. He sends them out on a mission with a purpose and he sends them out to serve people. Now, here's what I think is really fascinating about this. Jesus sends them out in advance. Before he goes back to heaven, before he ascends back up to be with the Father, he sends them out. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, Ezra, he did this for preparation. And I think that's probably true. I think that's true to a degree, but I think it's so much more than just preparation. You see, if we turn over three chapters to Mark 9, we see the reason that Jesus is sending them out. Mark chapter 9, verse 33. It says, After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in the house, Jesus asked his disciples, What were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer because they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. He sat down called the 12 disciples over to him and said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be a servant of everyone else. Then he put a little child among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also the father who sent me. First off, I love the humor in this. For anyone that's a parent, you know exactly what's going on here. Jesus' disciples, they're, they're talking and, and they're bragging. They're arguing about who is the greatest amongst these 12. And Jesus, listening in on their conversation, he asked them, hey guys, what are you talking about? If you're a parent, you get this. There are times that you listen to your kids and they're talking and, and, and you kind of just interrupt and you say, hey guys, what are we talking about? And then, of course, your kids go silent, right? They don't answer. It's like, oh, we weren't supposed to be talking about that, so we're not going to answer. If you're a guy, you also get this, right? Everything to us as guys is a competition, right? I mean, we can't sit down for a meal without having a competition. We don't go to Top Golf without it being a competition. We don't hang out and shoot baskets without it being some kind of competition. We have a basketball hoop in front of our house and, and every night I'm out there with my kids and we're shooting hoops and eventually some of my neighbors come down and it always turns into a competition between me and my neighbors. My kid's like, dad, I don't want to play. I'm like, no, 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 we're in a competition right now. This is serious. Anytime guys get together, it's a competition. And for this, it was the exact same way. It was a total competition. But the title of this section of scripture for Mark chapter 9 is the greatest in the kingdom. And what Jesus is talking about, he says, the greatest in the kingdom is the least. You see, Jesus' metrics for measuring greatness is so much different than ours. It's not based on the number of followers or likes or shares or retweets. It's not based on the number of letters after your last name. It's not based on what you have in your bank account or what your position is or the number of cars you have in your driveway. 
Jesus' metrics is so different for this. His metrics is when we serve him, when we say yes to him, when we obey him. And that is what he's talking about here. You see, if you have a relationship with Jesus, it's all about serving him. And if you are walking in this relationship with him and you're saying, hey, Ezra, I'm a follower of Jesus, wherever you're watching, wherever you're engaging from, if you would say, I'm a follower of Jesus, then for us, we have, uh, it's in our bones, it's in, it's in our spiritual DNA that, that we have a culture of serving people. One of the things that I've been teaching my kids ever since they were born is that we are a family. And part of being a family is that we, that we serve one another. Now, when my oldest two children were growing up, they would always object. I'd ask them to pick up toys that weren't theirs or to help with some dishes that they didn't, they didn't eat off of. And their response was, well, it's not mine. And my response is, we're a family. We serve one another. Now that my youngest has grown up, he's kind of gone to the same season where he's saying, dad, that's not my toy. Dad, that's not my dish. That's not my laundry. And now instead of me saying, hey, son, we're a family. We serve one another. Guess who's telling him? My other two children. They're the ones telling him, hey, we're a family. A part of being a family is that we serve one another, that we take care of one another. And the same is true of this spiritual family, of this expression of Jesus, this local church, mission church. We have a core value, and it's this, that we live and love like Jesus. And if Jesus lived one way, then we want to live the same way. If it was a priority to him to serve people, it's a priority for us to serve people. But here's the problem. We don't always do that. We don't always do that because we have this misconception and today I want to take a moment to look at a couple different misconceptions when it comes to serving Jesus and serving one another. Now the first misconception is this, is that serving is too much of a commitment. I know for some of us we have this thought that I don't want to make a commitment to something. I don't want to serve the local church. I don't want to serve my spiritual family. I don't want to commit to serving on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or leading a group throughout the week because what if something else comes up on that Tuesday night? Or what if something else happens on that, 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 that Sunday morning and I have this commitment, but I want to do this? But here's the reality to that misconception. You are committing to making an impact. You're committing to making a major impact in the life of someone else. Every Sunday, I thank people that serve here. Throughout the week, I do my best to text and to call to reach out to those that are serving in different areas and say, thank you, thank you for serving here. And by and large, the response that I get is, Pastor, thank you for the opportunity. Pastor, I love serving. Pastor, this is one of the greatest things that I can do. You see, when, when we commit to serving, the reality is, is that we're committing to making their lives better, to helping them grow in their relationship with Jesus to helping them further others along the way. Another misconception is uh, people say this, they say, I serve all week long. I don't want to serve on the weekend. I, I'm, a, I'm a server. I'm a waiter. That's what I do for a living. I don't want to serve on the weekend. I serve Monday through Friday or Tuesday through Saturday, and I don't want to serve on Sundays. I talk to other people and they say, you know, I'm an, I'm an assistant I'm an assistant to uh, this person and all I do is serve them. I'm on call 24 hours a day and I don't want to serve on Sundays. I don't want to serve by leading a group. I just, I serve all the time. Others of you say this, you say, I'm a parent. I'm a parent 24 hours a day. I don't want to go serve other people's kids on Sunday. It's not what I want to do. I just need a break. I need some time off. We have this misconception that we serve all week and we need a break. But here's the reality. When you're serving Jesus, you're not serving people, you're serving him. When we serve, ultimately, we're not just serving other people, we're ultimately serving him. Remember what we just read a, a moment ago? And in case you forgot it, let me read it again. Mark chapter nine, verse 37. And Jesus says, anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also the Father who sent me. 
He says, listen, when you're welcoming, when you're serving, when you're loving, when you're caring for people, you're not just doing it for that person. Ultimately, you're doing it for me. Another misconception that I often hear, I, I hear people say this often, that, that serving isn't my natural predeposition, right? Like that's just for other people, right? Like I'm just not naturally a servant. Ezra, it's just, it's just not, I'm not good at it. Like some people are really good. I, I'm just not good at it. Uh, a while back, uh, we were with some friends and um, we, were, we were hanging out and uh, some of our friends go to different churches and, and that's okay, that's a good thing, I guess. And, and so we're hanging out and, and my wife is talking to one of my friends and, and he says this comment uh, that his, his church is, is, is a church plant they just started and, and they're portable. And, and he said this comment, he said, I, uh, she said, are, are you helping set up and tear down? And he goes, no, 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 no. That's not what I wanna do with my Sunday. And I love my wife because she's, uh, she's just so, she's, she's so passionate. She said, that, she goes, listen, like, I don't think anyone else there wants to do that with their Sunday. But it's not about Sundays. It's about, it's about Jesus. It's about our Savior. And they kind of pushed back and they said, listen, that's for other people. I'm not, I'm not gifted. I'll, I'll do this or I'll do that or I'll, I'll serve in different ways. And, and, and my wife, again, just very graciously said, listen. That's not for other people. That's, that's for you because you're part of this church. And she goes, I can't encourage you enough to step up on Sundays and to help the setting up and the tearing down and, and the loading in and the loading out. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And serving might not be necessarily your natural predeposition. I know it's not mine. I'm a very selfish person. I have to fight this all the time. Even though it's not our predeposition, you know what it is? It's his invitation. His invitation to say, come and follow me. Come and, 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 and pick up your cross and follow me. Come and lay down your life like I lay down my life and follow me. That's what Jesus is inviting us to. One of the, the very final things he did before dying on the cross is that Jesus got down on his knees and he began to wash the feet of his disciples. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. But, but what he did is he took a towel and began to wash their feet and for us, it's always been something that is so significant to us as a church. We, we've taken that very literally. If, if that was one of the final things Jesus chose to do, then man, we want to do that all the time. One of the phrases that we use here at Mission Church a lot is that we're not offering titles, but we're offering towels. Towels to serve, not literally to wash the feet of people, but literally to serve people. And a lot of people get turned off. You might be turned off like, man, I don't want to serve. I just want to watch. I don't want to, uh, to, to give up more of my Sunday. I just, I just want to do this and then kind of go about my day. I can't tell you over, over the years how many times people have come to me and they said, hey, I just want you to know I'm really good at leading worship or I'm really good at speaking or I've had a lot of practice uh, uh, speaking before, preaching before. Ezra, if you just need me to preach, I'll, I'll go ahead and preach for you. I'll go ahead and lead worship for Mission Church. And my response is always the same. My response is always, that's great. Hey, here's some chairs and we need to help, we need help stacking them. Man, you know what? That's great. I love that. You know what? Why don't you come join us and get, and get the church open and ready and set up? Or why don't you come change some diapers in the nursery? And then let's talk about that. We always offer the towel before we offer the title. And for a lot of people, that's the final conversation that they have. Because why? Because they want a position on a stage. They want a platform. Jesus was the opposite. He says, I'm going to get off my platform. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to serve those who follow me. And that's the model. Again, we live and love like Jesus. This week, we, uh, we were having our, our, our team chapel at the final Wednesday of every, of every month, we gather at noon and we have something called Team Chapel for everyone that serves here at Mission Church. And one of the things that God put on my heart was the reading from Monday's uh, journal entry level, the, the, the Lectio Divina journal. And, and so I pulled that out. And, and what God spoke to me in that moment is that when Samuel comes to anoint David as king, he asks his father, he says, do you have any sons, any other sons? It says, yeah, there's David, but he's out serving the sheep. And that phrase, before he's ever anointed king, he learns how to first serve. Before he's ever given a title, he's already picked up the towel. 
And I think that is so important for us as followers of Jesus. That before we ever lead, we first learn how to serve so that we can be servant leaders. David got it. Jesus got it. My prayer is that we would get it. We would get it as well. The final misconception I want to look at is this, is that serving sets me back. Serving sets me back. I can't do what I want to do because I'm stuck serving. Now, here's the reality I believe. I believe that serving brings out the best in us. You want to know when I first became a fan of food? It was when I was serving as a waiter in a restaurant. And I was exposed to the kitchen. I was exposed to all the different spices and nuances, and all the different ways to cook food and prepare it. That's when I became a big fan of food. I remember the first time, I remember going into college and thinking, man, I think that I maybe want to get married when I'm like 35 and start having kids at like 40. Like I was always that guy that just thought, I, I want to be a bachelor for a long time. There's a whole lot of things I want to do and then I'll settle down. And then one summer, I served at a camp and I worked with all these third and fourth and fifth graders and hanging out with them, I thought, man, I don't want to wait till I'm 40 for this. I want to experience this younger in my life. And I fell in love with the idea of having a family. I remember the first time thinking, man, I want to own a home. The first time I, I wanted to ever own a home was when I was helping some friends right after college move into their home. And, and it's like we walk in and we're unloading all these things. And listen, I hate moving. I would rather have surgery than move. And yet being in their home and watching these dreams come to life and the plans and the excitement and then coming over all the time after that and just experiencing this home, I thought, man, I want to be a homeowner one day. I want to experience that. All of those things happened because I had an opportunity to serve. I believe that serving brings out the best in us. It was Bob Dylan, a musician that said, you got to serve somebody. And I believe that's true. In part, I also believe it's not something that we have to do. I believe it's the way that God wired us. I believe it's the way that he created us. I believe that it's in the fibers of who we are. You see, I believe that serving is part of our DNA and it's also part of our destiny. God created us to serve, but not everyone discovers this passionate pursuit because we get caught up in all of these other misconceptions. You see, here's the thing. Serving doesn't set us back. Serving sets us free. Serving doesn't set us back into something. It doesn't hold us back. It literally propels us into freedom, into the life that God has for us. I've had many moments in my life where I've just felt stuck. Can you relate? I've had a lot of moments in my life where I just, I feel stuck. I feel like I'm in a rut and my relationships are good. I'm praying a lot. And I try all kinds of things. I'll start praying more. I'll reach out to friends and mentors and say, hey, I feel stuck. Help me get unstuck, right? I'll work out more. I'll start a new diet. I'll do all kinds of things just to kind of like, you know, help me get unstuck. And by and large, the thing that helps me to get unstuck is when I say, God, I just, I need to serve you in a new way. God, I've been living for myself. That's why I'm stuck. I need to start serving you in a new capacity. God, what are you inviting me into? What's the invitation that you are inviting me into? The truth is that if you feel stuck, I can't encourage you enough. Start serving God. I read something last week. And as I, after reading it a couple days later, I was talking to one of the ladies in our church and she literally quoted what I had been reading. It's from a book by Mark Batterson called All In. And you know when you read something and someone quotes it to you a couple days later, you know God's trying to speak to you. And this is what Mark says. He says, I know some people who have been saved for 25 years, but they don't have 25 years of experience. They have one year of experience repeated 25 times. Man, if you want to grow in Jesus, if you want to find breakthrough in your life, if you want to find purpose, if, if you want to get unstuck, then I can't encourage you enough. Sign up to serve. Sign up to serve today. Go to our website right after this is over and say, I want to join a team. Fill out your information. You can write all of it in there. If you want to get unstuck, start serving. Some of you right now, 
you're watching this on a laptop or maybe a desktop. I, and maybe, maybe your laptop is, is just covered in stickers. I know my wife and my daughter both love to cover their laptops in stickers. Not me, I'm too OCD for that, but their laptops are just covered in stickers. And if you were to look at that laptop, you'd think, wow, that's not a laptop, that is a, that's a Winnebago, that's an Airstream, that's a trailer, because on my wife's laptop are covered stickers of all these different destinations that she's been to. And you might think, wow, that's just like what people do to an RV. If you look at my daughter's laptop, you think, okay, what's with all the llamas, right? That's not a computer. That's like a, a, an honor to llamas. And I don't know why or where or how she got into llamas, but she loves llamas. And her, her entire laptop is covered in stickers of llamas. Now, here's the reality. The reality is, is that, that, that you might look at those things and, and you don't even see the Apple symbol on those laptops. And you might question, what is that? I think in the same way, in the same way we get covered with all of these misconceptions and we begin to lose our identity of who God called us to be. We don't feel like we were created, we, we, weren't, we aren't the thing that God created us to be. That's still a laptop. I mean, you don't need to peel off the layers for it to know that it's a laptop. But maybe for you in your life, maybe you need to peel off some of these layers of these misconceptions to say, how do I live according to the way God created me to live. My laptop, again, it's OCD. But right now I'm having an issue with it. Uh, on my laptop, there is this button, the V button, that is stuck. And I've tried all kinds of different things. I can't get it unstuck. And, and here's what's unique about it right now. It, is I'm writing this message on serving. I'm typing the letter V a whole lot. I mean, hundreds of times I feel like in this message. And, and what happens is this word comes out and my computer tries to like think it's something else. And so it rewrites the word differently or it just misspells. And I look at the, weird, the word and I'm like, that word is weird. That's a weird looking word. It's missing the letter. It's missing the V. Now, if you take the letter V out of the word serve, you get something that looks weird. I think the same is true in our lives. When we're not serving, we get kind of weird. We get kind of uh, caught up in ourselves. It's all about us. It's all about living for ourselves. And what do we want? Here's the other thing. As I'm typing this message, there's another word that keeps coming up. And when it's missing the V, it too looks weird. It's the word live. Now think about it. When you take out the V in the word live, what do you get? You get lie. And that's exactly what these misconceptions do. When we buy into these misconceptions, we begin to buy into the lies. That it's all about us. That it's our way right away. That it's whatever we want. And Jesus says, no, I'm calling you to live differently. I'm calling you to follow me and to lay down your life. What I said a moment ago of Jesus when uh, he begins to wash his disciples' feet, one of the final acts that he does, one of the final things that he does is that he gets down, he stoops down, and he takes off their sandals. And in this day and age, there, there, there were no paved roads, there were no sidewalks, there were no pathways covered in crushed granite like maybe you have in your neighborhood or the park. I mean, it's just dirt and mud and some animal remains that have been left behind and, and it's gross and it's nasty. And the lowest of the lowest of the lowest of servants was the one that would wash the feet of people as they came into the home. And Jesus says, I'm gonna take that position. I'm gonna take that position. I'm gonna wash your feet. And as Jesus is doing this, one of his followers named Peter, Peter objects. He says, whoa, 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 Jesus, you can't do this. You're Jesus. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. You can't do this. And what does Jesus respond to? He says this. He says, unless you allow me to do this, you can have no part of me, Peter. Unless you allow me to do this, you can have no part of me whatsoever. The reason Jesus said this to Peter is because Peter didn't understand he didn't grasp the, the, the significance of what he's doing, but he will later on. When my wife and I got married, we made the decision that we wanted to wash each other's feet 
as part uh, of our wedding, of part of our ceremony. It's one of the first things we did to each other. And now I remember this so distinctly. My wife is 5'1". She has these petite, cute little shoes and she has this beautiful, uh, these beautiful feet. And I take off this little shoe and, and I just I very gently wash. And my, my hands can literally, her feet can fit inside of my hands. Now I'm 6'1". And my wife is now taking off my shoes and my feet are, are, are twice the size of her hand. And what was so, so kind of sweet and almost precious as I washed her feet, she's struggling to wash my feet. They're big. They got hair on them. It's kind of weird. It's awkward. There's no pedicure or manicure, whatever it is that you do to your feet. It's none of that, right? But here's the thing. Over these last 13 years of marriage, that moment is one of the moments that comes back to my mind every single day. When I don't feel like serving her, when I don't want to serve her, I flash back to that moment, to that picture. You see, back then I didn't understand the significance of it, but now I do. My role as her husband is more than just to love her and care for her and provide for her and protect her. It's more than to meet her needs, to lead her spiritually. It's so much more than that. It's also to serve her, to lay my life down for her when I want to and when I don't want to, when I feel like it and when I don't feel like it, when she's when I'm, I'm tired and I'm not tired, when she's asking for something or, or she's not. My role as her husband is to outserve anyone else on this planet for her. And that's what Jesus did for us. And that's what he invited us to do the same. You see, his disciples didn't understand the significance of it. I didn't understand the significance of it with my wife until now. Many of you don't understand the significance of serving, but, but for one day we will. Here's what's unique. When my kids finish a sports season, they're given a trophy. And it doesn't matter if they won all the games and the tournament. It doesn't matter if they lost all the games and the tournament. They're given a trophy. Last season, we won out. We we won all of our games, won the championship. And I'm coaching this great group of players And they're looking around after the final game and they're like, hey, we got the same medal as everybody else. Like we went undefeated. We worked so hard. And they who didn't win a game all season, they get the same trophy. They get the same medal. Now, I don't know what your take is on this. I could spend a lot of time talking about it, but I'm not going to. I just don't know if this sets them up well for life. These participation trophies. Here's what I do know. Participation trophies do not set us up well for eternal life. You see, at the end of our lives, Jesus will turn to us and he will say or not say these words. He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Or he won't. You catch that? Well done, good and faithful. Not husband not wife, not CEO, not intern, but servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. And any of us that are living for Jesus, those are the words that we're longing to hear. And my question is for you today, is if if today was the end, if you were to put a period right now, would Jesus say those words to you? We say, well done, you've been a great servant, not just on Sundays, but to anyone and everyone. If you would say no, I want to invite you. I want to encourage you to think differently about the way you live your life. I want to invite you and encourage you to sign up and join a serve team here. I want to invite you and encourage you to join us for Connect tonight, where we talk all about this and we, we talk all about the vision and the mission of this church. I can't encourage you enough. I can't uh, inspire you enough. But I can invite you to say, God, I want to be someone that one day you too would say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to be someone that serves my family, serves my roommate, serves my coworkers, serves the barista at my favorite coffee shop. I, I want to serve them well. I don't just want to serve one day a week. I want to serve all the time. I want to invite you to take 
that step today. Would you bow your head with me? What are you living for? Are you living for yourself, if you're honest, or are you living for something greater than yourself? Are you living for others to serve you, or are you living the kind of life where you would say, I wanna serve others, I wanna live like Jesus did? Jesus, today I lift up every person that's been engaged in this message. Today I pray that, Lord, you would help us to be people that get it, that understand it, that know it. What you've invited us into, Lord, it's, it's not a setback, Lord. It's, it's you releasing us to a life of purpose. It's in our DNA. It's in our destiny. And God, you've called us to be the kinds of people that pick up our cross and follow you, that serve everyone we come in contact with. I pray today that we would take the next steps to say yes to you. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Hey, tonight I wanna invite you to join us for Connect. Connect is a time for you to discover everything that Mission is about to hear the vision, to hear the mission, to hear all the things that we offer for you and your family. It's a chance for you to meet our staff and to meet myself, a chance for us to get to know you a little bit. Really, it's a chance for you to grow in your relationship with Jesus and find purpose of really what are we about as a church and where do we sense God is calling us to go. I can't encourage you enough, even if you've been part of the church for this last season, if you haven't come to Connect before, would you join us? We want to celebrate Mother's Day with you next week, Sunday, May 9th at our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services. We're going to have a photo booth for you and your friends and family. And ladies, stop by our cafe and have a craft coffee on us to you. We can't wait to celebrate together.